We are all the way to Revelation chapter eight. Now, uh, for those of you that are brand new to Revelation or you've avoided it your whole life, uh, these are the reasons you've avoided it, okay? We're in that section. So Revelation chapter six through 19 is, is tough. Uh, it's typically when people uh, decide, I'm not gonna read anymore uh, because it gets really difficult and there's lots of judgments and the judgments just seem to like stack. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. And you come away feeling more defeated. And because the writer, as we talked about last week, is using images and pictures from the Old Testament that many of us have either never heard or we don't understand, we're just like, I don't know, I don't know anything that he's talking about other than this sounds awful, right? And, uh, and so we stop reading. And I would say that the verses we're gonna look at today are prime candidates for why people don't read the book of Revelation. And if, if you're brand new to church today, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> what a great day. Uh, it was funny, I met a family brand new. It was their first Sunday today uh, at the first gathering. I said, man, these, these are some tough passages for you to come on your first day uh, and, and hear because they're just tough passages that we avoid. But I pray that the overall perspective and um, the truth uh, of why this is in here will, 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 will be communicated clearly in that we can uh, understand and, and see what God has for us here in spite of how it just seems to take this depressing, depressing uh, mood. Uh, and so let's, let's, let's kick off this in, in Revelation chapter eight. Uh, we have already been introduced to this new set of judgments called the trumpet judgments. Uh, and if you haven't been following along, uh, we were introduced earlier into three sets of seven judgments, okay? Uh, and and uh, I'm gonna have them throw a graph on the screen that I pray doesn't confuse you more, um, but it might, okay? Uh, and so... Essentially, when you think of three sets of seven judgments, uh, there are three, I would say, um, overarching um, thoughts and beliefs uh, on how they align and how they work together, okay? And the first and the one that, um, that I see that, that I think scripture has a strong case for uh, because the, seven, the, the seventh judgment in each, it, it, it literally shows us the return of Christ, right? Uh, and so uh, the first graph would be the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. They're all happening at the same time, and we're getting different pictures of it. We're, different, we're getting different angles of the things that are happening during this stretch. The others is, uh, another way is just to take it extremely literal and go seven, seven, seven. And seven seals happen, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Uh, and, and there's some that go that route. Then the last is where they're, they're, they're within each other, but not completely. Yeah. Okay, now, as some of you are more confused than you were when you came in, uh, that's helpful because you may, in your Bible, have one of the, have, have one of those, have one of those graphs, okay? You may have it. And it's important for you to know the why. And that also helps you to understand if you have a study Bible, uh, there's usually a prominent writer, theologian behind it, who will take a specific approach to this book. And this helps you understand their approach. Okay. And that should help you make sense uh, of that. Okay. And so we see these seven trumpet judgments that we're going to look at. And uh, what's helpful again for us to know is that how John is writing is not necessarily in chronological order. Remember, he is just telling us, this is what I saw next. Okay. So it, it, a lot of times we just want it to be chronological. Like, all of us want that to be the case, uh, but oftentimes we see it in the Old Testament and even in the book of Revelation, we see that's not the case. What he's just telling us is, then I saw this, then I saw that. And we're left to, to try and understand and see what he was looking at. And so he's gonna go into these trumpet judgments, which we see uh, a different angle of those uh, seven seals in. Okay, so in Revelation chapter eight, let's look at verse six, it says, now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up. 
and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. Awesome. Perfect verses for baptism Sunday. Very appropriate. Um, We don't line those up usually, as you can tell, but what do we see here? right? We see uh, a section that, that's difficult, it's frustrating, and um, man, it just it seems uh, so destructive, okay? And, and, and the thing that we need to see is John, who is writing based upon what he's seen, he is recalling the plagues that we see in Exodus, right? The plagues with the Egyptians. If you grew up uh, at all with, with parents that were reading you Bible stories, you're familiar with the plagues in Egypt, okay? Uh, through Moses and Aaron there. And, and so he's recalling these plagues and the imagery of these plagues throughout uh, this section. And so we see the first of the angels blew uh, his trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. It says a third of the earth and the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Okay, now what this reminds us of is the imagery of the first Egyptian plague uh, in Exodus chapter 9, 22 through 25. And let me just read that. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, one man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Okay, so so he's using this imagery that that people were familiar with. They remembered this event. And he's drawing back from this Old Testament uh, story. And, And as we try to make sense of what he's describing here, which is so difficult... We have to remember he's using apocalyptic language um, and, and he's using oftentimes symbols to convey truth and, and he's using the Old Testament, right? And so uh, some believe that the fire that's used here when he uses the word fire, that uh, as is stated in different parts of Revelation uh, and scripture where fire is used uh, as an analogy of judgment, of God's judgment. Some believe that, that this fire then is, is not literal, but figurative in speaking of God's judgment. But we see that this, this phrase burned up, it, it occurs three times in just one verse. And then blood, we see, is, is thrown out. And that's uh, likely symbolic of just terrible judgment on the earth. And, and what we see happening, though, overall, it reminds us and draws us back to the ministry of Jesus. Remember, all of this points back to Jesus. Uh, and, and this reminds us of words that Jesus promised would happen and he prophesied that these things would take place. In Luke 21, verses 25 to 28, these are Jesus's words. It says, and there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Okay, now, now when you read it through the lens of what Jesus is saying, uh, it's kind of like, oh, this is, this is incredible, right? 
It's no longer just this depress, depressing train of it's getting worse, it's getting worse. All of a sudden we see, wait a second, Jesus said this was gonna happen. And he said, when you start to see these things happen, don't shrink away, shy away, shy away and, and just get all discouraged and oh, what's gonna happen? No, he says, straighten up because redemption is at hand. Okay, so, so there's a posture shift, right? Uh, for some of us, when we think of all of these things happening, it's, it's just like, man, why? Why? And uh, versus when we read it and we go, wait a second, he's saying that these are going to happen at a time when he's about to come. And so there should be this posture of anticipation. Okay. But whatever these image, images specifically represent, great uh, devastation follows is, is very clear. Okay. Uh, and then John sees something. It says like a great mountain ablaze with fire was hurled into the sea. Okay, now, once again, he's trying to capture language to describe what he's seen, and he can't. So what he does is he continually pulls back from familiar language of the Old Testament. Okay, and, and so what we see once again is uh, him going back to uh, the judgment uh, of the Egyptian plague, right? Um, because we just read that a third of the sea becomes blood and a third of the living creatures, they die and a third of the ships are destroyed. And it reminds us of Exodus chapter seven, when it says Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile and all the water in the Nile turned into blood and the fish in the Nile died and the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And so uh, he's using this imagery again, going back to the plagues. And as we already talked about, fire is oftentimes an image of judgment. And in Revelation, when mountains uh, are being talked about, it speaks uh, of kingdoms, both good and bad, earthly and heavenly kingdoms. Um, but we see in the Old Testament, mountains, we see them representing nations and they're often portrayed as the object of God's wrath when he describes them as a mountain. Okay, in fact, uh, what, this, what this tells us is this picture could be speaking of judgment against an evil kingdom. Uh, Jeremiah, going back to the prophet Jeremiah, he speaks of Babylon as a destroying mountain which will be burned by fire. Uh, in Jeremiah 51, 25, uh, he says, behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, declares the Lord, which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you a burnt mountain. Later in that same chapter, he speaks of Babylon as, um, as one that's sinking into the waters, never to rise again. Okay, so once again, John is pulling Old Testament language, Old Testament imagery and inserting it here for us to try and understand what he's saying, okay? The third trumpet then blows, and we read that a great blazing star named Wormwood falls from heaven on a third of the rivers and springs, and the waters, it says, become Wormwood, and many people die from its bitter poison, okay? Now, this word, Wormwood, we're like, why did it get named that? It's only here in the New Testament, and it's mentioned eight times in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it's always associated as this plant that, that produced a bitterness, a poison that ultimately led to people uh, dying. And so we see even the language here coming back from Jeremiah chapter nine and 23, where God judges his people who are disobedient by, it says, giving them wormwood and poison water to drink. Now, it's not clear whether John uh, intends the star to be understood naturally or supernaturally, right? Uh, this, is it an angel? Is it a, an asteroid? Like, like, and when we get so caught up in that, we start to lose sight of the result. And so we can't get so caught up in the weeds that we miss out on what he's saying actually is the result of whatever catastrophe this actually is. And so we go to the fourth trumpet, that sounds, and it says a third of the stars, sun and moon are darkened, okay? Once again, 
we're brought back to the plagues in Egypt, aren't we? In fact, the ninth plague in Egypt, uh, in, in Exodus chapter 10, uh, where it says in verse 21, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. And, and darkness was all throughout the land. We read in Amos, we read in Joel that the day of the Lord is going to be a time of darkness, not light. Okay, now here, here's the challenge, guys. As, as we navigate this and, and already our heads are spinning, it's tough because we are tempted to either go in this overly literal way with everything we're reading, or we're tempted to just make everything a symbol, right? Just It's symbolic, okay? So there's no... Uh, there's no truth to it or reality to it. And uh, the bottom line is uh, what Revelation challenges you to do is not to fall into either extreme. Uh, it's clearly he's speaking of images, of symbols, but there's also uh, times where he's very clear uh, in what uh, he is seeing. And, and as we think about these symbols, these realities, what they're representing is is things that, that are going to happen. And the bottom line here that we cannot miss is, is this message. Do not put your ultimate hope in any created thing. Okay, that's the bottom line here. Like regardless of everything you just tried to swallow that, 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 I, that I read, is you need to hear that we cannot place our hope in any created things, because all things, as we're reading, as it continues, all things, even the, even the things, um, you know, that we would say, this is the most secure, I can rest in that. Like, there's things you don't even think about that you rely on, right? Like sunlight, okay? Um, like yesterday, we're all outside going, oh God, please, please, God, don't let it go away, right? Um, but, and maybe in this area, we're a little more aware of the sun than in other places, right? Um, but we, we just count on it, right? We, 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 we count on certain things. And, and, and the tendency, though, is for us to find our security in different things. And what this challenges us to do is to say, hey, um, that will not measure up, that will not last, and it will not provide for what you're hoping it does. Okay, um, and, 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 and so, so what he's doing here as all of these things that are just destruction on the earth, as they're happening, he's showing these people that all of these things that you've been placing your faith and your hope and your trust in to thrive and to live, they're not worth it. They won't last. There's only one who is worthy of the throne and it's me. And the reason we see him drawing back on the, on the Old Testament, on this, um, the, the Egyptian and, the, and the, um, the plagues during that time is what was God doing then, you guys? God was showing the Egyptians that I am sovereign. Like I am sovereign over all the gods you worship. When you study the plagues, he was literally systematically destroying all of their gods and showing that he is preeminent. He is omnipotent, right? He is all powerful. And so what he does here is say, listen, this is much bigger than just these, the localized plague. This now is the world. And I am showing every person who is alive during this time that I am worthy, I am sovereign, and I am over all of these other things that you cannot depend on. You guys, <laughs> earthly things, if you're gonna place your hope and your trust in it, it's gonna turn on you. Like it's gonna turn on you. Like, like that, that's what it does. It's, it's not a dependable thing. If, if, uh, and we're going to talk more about this in a minute. Like if, if everything in my life is about money, my money can turn on me just like that. Okay. And money turning on, you're like, no, my money hasn't turned on me. My money keeps increasing. Well, you know what? It may be turning on you in a different way. It may be turning on your marriage. It may be turning on your relationship with your kids. Okay, uh, you think of other things in your life uh, that you're going to be tempted to essentially worship and to place on the throne and you're relying on it for your happiness, for your peace. And you're doing all these things. And God is like, listen, none of it's going to last. It's all going to go away. And I want you to see it. I don't want you to miss it. That's why it says those who listen and respond to the words of revelation, they're going to be blessed because they're going to have the right priorities. They're going to understand and know that God is sovereign. 
Okay, and so as he's continued to uh, use this, uh, this language, this figurative lang- language, he's, uh, you, you see him use different Greek words for the word like, and the reason he's doing that is because he doesn't have the language to describe what he's seeing, right? He's, he's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, and like, okay? And so that's what it's like. All right, in verse 13, Uh, we see a transition here. In verse 13, it says, uh, then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Okay, so this is a transition into chapter nine. And and so the last three trumpets, Literally, uh, they're, they're being introduced and they're being introduced uh, in a way where he's saying, I'm seeing something new now, right? So w- what does he say? He says, then I looked and I heard. So he's seeing something new. He's hearing something new. And what does he see? He sees this eagle, right? The symbolism of this, of this eagle and, 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 and he's hearing this voice. And, and so before uh, the last three angels sound their trumpet, this, this threefold woe is pronounced over the earth in this loud voice. And the first woe is with the fifth trumpet. The second woe is with the sixth trumpet. And the third woe is with the seventh, okay? And so he is addressing all now of these people on the earth. Uh, in fact, he uses uh, language, uh, those who live on the earth, and that's used of those who are living not just on the earth, but for the earth. They're in rebellion towards uh, God. They're living in this unbelief. And, and, and so he's saying, listen, these are the woes, all right? And, and, and so this is gonna get worse. This is worse than the initial four trumpets. Why is it worse? because these judgments are going to be directly um, focused on these people, right? Like like we saw wrath operating, we saw nature being uh, destroyed in all these ways, but now he says, these are the woes. It is now going to be directed at you. And so in chapter nine, verse one, it says, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. If your kids are in here, that you got a challenging conversation on the car ride home. <laughs> My oldest has been reading through the book of Revelation and he comes in and he just starts grilling me. And I'm like, bud, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> and everything is literal to him, right? So he's got locusts with human heads and long hair and scorpion stingers and tails with snake heads on them. And he's just glued in, right? Um, but let's, let's try and understand what we have here. So he, the angel blows this fifth star or this fifth trumpet and John sees this star that has fallen from heaven to the earth. And, and, and the thing that we need to see here is, it says it had fallen. Like this is past tense, it had fallen, and yet it still has a continuing result, right? Uh, and so what, what is this star? Well, the star is a person. There's personal pronouns that are applied to it throughout. And, and we also see that this statement in particular is reminiscent of what Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, when he said, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Okay, so, so the best interpretation of this text uh, leads us to believe this is Satan himself. 
He had already fallen. This had already occurred according to Isaiah 14. And when he fell, remember he was an angel worshiping God, but he wanted his own glory. And, and so he turns against God, grabs all these followers uh, in, who are in opposition to God. Those are the demons. And, 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 and he's cast out, right? He is cast out. And so Jesus is describing that scene as he's cast out into God's, uh, out of God's presence. And now we pick up here where, it's, it, where we read how he's allowed a freedom on the earth that he was previously denied, okay? And, and, and so he's given here the, the key, he's given the authority uh, to open up, it says the shaft of the abyss, right? Uh, for some of us, we're like, we're in a crazy movie right now, right? And, and this is this prison house for all of these all of these demons, right, who, who we read about in Scripture where God is like, I'm not letting you out. Like, there's some that are, some I'm not letting out. And, and so uh, as soon as Satan has the ability, has the key to this abyss, he immediately opens it. And it talks about this imagery of smoke, of darkness, uh, of heat. And it just fills the air and it darkens the sun. And then we see these demons in the form of locusts flooding the earth. And we see power and authority given to them, it says, like scorpions over their prey. And we see that this, once again, is drawing back from the eighth plague on Egypt in Exodus chapter 10, verse 12, right? It says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. We also see in Joel chapter one and two, him speaking about this locust vision as well. Now, are these literal locusts? I don't know. No, these are demons, right? These are demons, okay? They are released to torment mankind spiritually, physically, psychologically, and in any other conceivable way, okay? So, so they're just sent out to literally harass humanity and, and, and to wage war on humanity so that humanity destroys uh, essentially itself, right? Um, unlike the, uh, the locusts in Exodus, these locusts, they don't harm the vegetation at all, right? They only harm, and this is important to see, they only harm those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Remember, if you've been hanging with us throughout this series, those who are Jesus followers who have made a decision to receive him as their Lord and Savior, they are sealed. They are set aside. They, they are renamed. They belong to God. They are about his plan and his purpose. And so as you read this, you guys, and as you just go, this is crazy. This is nasty. I don't like it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to think about it. I want you to make sure you do not miss what's actually happening here. Because what we see is God's, even in the midst of this wrath and judgment, once again, God's sovereign hand of authority and protection is on display, right? He says, you can't touch those that are sealed. Don't touch them. And, and, and what are the demons gonna do? No, like, no, they can't. Okay, so he says, you're not gonna touch them. They also are not allowed to kill. He says, you're not going to kill. So they're not allowed uh, to, to kill. They're only allowed to torment people. And it says only for five months. Now, we don't know if that's just symbolic for a short period of time or if it's five months because that's the life expectancy for locusts. We're, we're not sure. But either way, there is an established timeline where God is once again saying, I'm in complete control and you're only allowed to do this for this much time. And, and remember, once again, this is apocalyptic literature. And so uh, we're, we're struggling to make sense of all of the particulars of, of, of these, these demons, right? But what's certain is that what they're going to do to humanity is going to be horrible. The torment is going to be so bad, we read, that people are going to seek, are, they're going to want to die. Take me out, I want out. And yet we read that they're going to be longing for death. They're going to be running after death, and yet they can't catch it right? They're going to want to kill themselves and not be able to. It's going to be so bad. 
And so we keep going in verse seven and it says, in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. You're like, oh, yep, it got worse. (laughs) Okay, so once again, John's detailed description of these these locusts, uh, he's once again using the word what? Like, like, like. Over and over again, he's telling us that he's struggling to describe what he's seen. And so what he does is he just heaps image upon image upon image. Um, And what he's doing is he's forcing us to just feel the horror of this judgment. He's like, it's like this. It's it's, it's like this. You know, some of you uh, enjoy horror movies. Don't raise your hand if you do, because... I don't understand that. Oh, let's pay money to get scared. That sounds fantastic. Like, I don't get it, but never caught on for me. But some of you do that, right? And when you come back from that movie, um, you start telling people all about it. And, and, and oftentimes these horror movies have things that are just like bizarre. And, and you start saying the word like. It was like, and it was like this movie. And then it was like that. And then this happened like that, right? And you're, you're trying to describe, and overall what you're trying to tell the person you're talking to about this horror movie is why they would be so scared or why they should be so scared, right? And, and, and so what he's doing is he's just stacking these images using Old Testament language and prophecy so that we'll understand the magnitude of just how awful this is. Okay, and and so what he's doing is, once again, he's pulling Old Testament scenes, Old Testament words from the prophet's language, uh, those that resemble what he's seeing. And so we see, as he's describing this, we see him literally pulling uh, from these verses, right? His vision of the locusts, like horses prepared for battle, that is completely connected with Joel's portrayal of the plague of locusts attacking Israel, uh, which also began by the blowing of a trumpet in Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Um, we, we see um, uh, essentially when he's talking about, um, and he's comparing locusts to horses and to men prepared for, for battle, that's, that's Joel chapter two, verses four through seven. And, and, and even their teeth is Joel chapter one, verse six, when he says teeth like lions, uh, the sound of their wings is like the sound of chariots and horses rusting into battle. That's Joel chapter two, verses four and five. You guys, so, so what, why am I telling you that? Why am I pointing back to, to Joel, who many of you didn't even know was a book in the Bible. <laughs> I'm pointing you back to that because here's where, we, here's where we miss the boat, okay? What happens is we read Revelation, we look at it, and then we try to take what we're reading and then we try to like move it forward to where we're at today and we try to see images from our lens of today and then what's tomorrow, right? Right? So everything that we read in Revelation oftentimes is geared around what we're seeing today that looks like that, right? That's why so many people uh, have written books and made so much money off of saying, this is what that actually is. This is that helicopter. This is that tank, right? Those books will always sell well. We buy them. Some of you have them on your shelf and you love it, right? And you'll keep buying them. So, but we see the temptation to take either what is or what is, what we believe is coming and we go, oh, that's what that is. That's what that is. And we miss sight of what we should be seeing because what John is looking at is what? The Old Testament. And so instead of looking at Revelation and going, what today and tomorrow, we should be looking at Revelation and going, Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. Because that's where these images are coming from. And so when we're trying to understand and see this, you guys, we have to first and foremost go, what what is he seeing from the Old Testament? In fact, most theologians who study Revelation, they will tell you that you first have to study the Old Testament in order to even begin to grasp Revelation. And that's so true. 
Okay, and so, and so we see this uh, imagery once again, and the image of these locusts, uh, it ends just as it began uh, that we saw in verses three through five by comparing their authority to the power which these scorpions have over their prey and that they're limited by the authority of God for these five months, okay? We also see that um, they have a leader, right? They have this leader. Uh, their leader uh, is called Abaddon or Apollyon, which is Hebrew and Greek for destroyer, okay? And these uh, names together uh, form the statement how th this angel is the king over the demons, suggesting that this is Satan uh, himself as their leader. It's, it's scary imagery, but that's the point, and then, we, and then verse 12 is this transition. It says, the, the first woe has passed. There are still two more. And so in verse 13, it says, then the sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number, and this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths." For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for the tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. <sighs> so the sixth angel sounds his trumpet, and a voice speaks from the golden altar before God, and he tells the angel to release. It says these four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, okay? Now, now these, it's saying these four angels. Now, what we believe is that these are, these are four uh, demons that have been held because one of the things you don't see in scripture is God holding back and, and tying up angels, right? Like, like his goal is to send angels. And we see here that these four fallen angels, um, they have been held back. They've been held back. And, and, and how it's worded here is we see that they had a specific plan and purpose. They had mapped out their desire. They are coming to kill. And so they are held back. Like, no, you're, you're not gonna do that. They have every detail, every thought, right? To the month, to the day, to the year. They are prepared to just unleash on humanity. And God says, listen, you can release them now. And they go to kill a third of mankind. Just crazy. If you, if you read this, literally, the enormity of the army was 200 million warriors. And, and still, the primary purpose is just to tell us this is a massive number. This is a massive army that is in opposition to who God is, to what God is about. And then he, again, gives us this vivid description of this demonic army uh, telling us the overall impression of these horses and their riders um, and the destructive forces of fire, of smoke and sulfur that comes out of their mouth and, and how it's by these three plagues that one third of mankind is to be killed. And there's power in the horse's tails. It says they resemble snakes, have heads and inflict injury. Now, once again, we can, we can try to spiritualize every image here, right? Or we can try and just create the most crazy looking thing you've ever seen. But ultimately, when it, when it talks about, you know, the, the power of the horses is in their mouths, what, what you need to know is there is going to be incredible, and there is today, a lot of demonic deception, Right? There's so much demonic deception. And we see even Jesus used imagery that kind of frightens us when he called the Pharisees. What did he call the Pharisees? This is Jesus. Jesus called the Pharisees serpents and vipers because they were blind guides leading others astray. That's what Jesus says about them. So this is that imagery. And, and so what we, what we need to understand is that there is very real spiritual opposition to what God wants to accomplish for humanity and for you. And, and sometimes, and it's tough because 
Uh, honestly, when, if you give this talk in, in a situation, in a, in a setting like this, most people just go, yeah, yeah, there's spiritual warfare and that. Like, yeah, thanks for the heads up, Steve. All right, on with my merry life and my job and my kids and my family and our activities and, and life's pretty good, right? But you go into other parts of the country and they're glued and they understand and they know and they've got stories that they specifically go, this is spiritual warfare that's attacked me, that's attacked my family, that's attacked what God is trying to do in my life. And I just think that right now, you guys, we are at this critical point and juncture in our community, in our church, and, and why it's so critical, why we're in such danger, I believe, of the spiritual opposition is because we don't see it or even acknowledge it. Life's pretty good for most of us. And, 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 and we've got an explanation for everything, don't we? We can explain away anything. It can't be that, though. Like, it can't be that. And yet, over and over again, he is speaking with language that is, like, unavoidably graphic and scary. And he's like, you need to understand the destructive forces against you. You need to understand what is being unleashed on, on humanity. You can't miss that. And, and they are going to just deceive, uh, and, and deception is going to be their uh, story. And I think what's so scary about this is, is how they're going to deceive us is going to be through idolatry. Uh, look at the end of this. In verse 20 and 21, it says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Okay, so, so God is like, all of this is happening. He's revealing it to us in the book of Revelation as unavoidable as, as, or, or as avoidable as it's been, maybe been for you and your life and your bookshelf. He says, you need to know this is what's going to happen. Th these are the markings. These are the makings of, of what it's going to look like. And, and this persecution, this opposition, what is going to happen to the world will be catastrophic. But in spite of all of that, these people are still not going to turn to God because idolatry has a hold of their heart. It literally has a hole in their heart. You guys, idolatry is so dangerous because it's not just this thing in our lives. It takes a hold of your heart. It, it, it doesn't play well in the sandbox, right? No, no, it wants to be the focus. And, and that's what happens. Idolatry in its nature is giving someone else the throne, right? Or something, the throne. And so what is so difficult for us in our culture is the very things that are going to mark you as successful, uh, as an employee, uh, as, as a husband maybe, as, as a father or, or a mother, uh, or, or, or things that are, that are going to cause other people to look up to you that you may be celebrated for, those very things in our culture might be idols. Ooh, that's tough. That's tough. And I think that's why it's so hard is we don't see it. We don't acknowledge it. And we don't evaluate, wait, who is on the throne? Who is on the throne here? And what he's saying is what they've put on that throne, what they're worshiping has such an entanglement on their heart that in spite of these supernatural, insane events that are going to happen, they're still going to not repent. They're going to choose to continue worshiping these very things. They refuse to worship the God who created and made them, but they gladly worship the gods of their hands. And we're brought to Romans 8, right? 24 and 25, when it says, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's what happened. That's what's happening. And so he connects all these idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. And he connects it. Don't miss this. He connects it with worshiping demons here, right? Because that's demonic activity at work. Demonic activity is deception to distract you from Jesus. And so anytime Jesus isn't on the throne, that's demonic. 
That's, that, that's, that's enemies operating and working to take your focus off of him. And then he lists these four sins that are additionally noted, murder, sorcery, sexual morality, and thefts. And these sins, man, we've seen them, right? They, they've afflicted humanity ever since the beginning. And they just continue. And so what's our takeaway from all this? Like, what do we take away? What's redeeming? What are we getting baptized to, Steve? <laughs> Well, here's the first thing. And guys, maybe this is like not a big deal to you. Maybe this is earth shattering, but this is not a message I hear anymore. You guys, Satan, demons, and evil are real. They are real. They are powerfully real. Powerfully real. Spiritual warfare is real. But, and this is probably the most, this is the most critically important truth from this. They are still under God's control. Okay? Ooh, don't even miss it. You guys, over and over again, what do you see? A third, a third, a third. Why is it highlighting a third? Why is it giving them a, a time that they can do this and a time it's going to stop? What is God doing? God is setting limits as to what they can do. In other words, he is sovereign over whatever and every kind of evil that there is to the point where, where they can't do anything without him saying, okay. That's how sovereign he is. He is above it all. And so what we see even in the midst of, of, of wrath and suffering here is that God is active, he's there, and he's working even in it. And guess what? The question that we then are confronted with is, are we listening or are we just going along with it? Are we listening to what he's saying? Are we ones that will repent? When, when we see uh, the misplacement of him as our focus, will we repent? Will we turn? Will we worship the God who made us? Will we worship him? Or are we going to worship all these other things that people are going to validate in your life, that they're going to encourage you in? And guys, I'll just say it again. Idols are made, if not, they are one of the main weapons used by the enemy to keep people in spiritual darkness. I mean, that's just what it is. And they're so masked because they're celebrated and they're looked at as good. The, the great reformer, Martin Luther, he's credited with saying, the devil is still God's devil. And his point is that clearly Satan is both evil and powerful, but he's still under the sovereign authority of God. There is only one God who has all authority and it's not Satan. And so nothing happens apart from the sovereign determination of God, nothing. And so when it comes to evil, and you guys, some of you have seen evil, evil has, has attacked you, it's attacked your family, it's attacked your kids, attacked your marriage. Um, some of you have seen this, uh, wickedness, things in your life that can only be described as wicked. You guys, and, and you think of those things and how awful they are. And, and, and you think of the destructive tools of Satan and the demons and even other human beings, right? Yeah. And just the wake of destruction and evil in their lives, you guys, and, and, and we see this and we get so caught up in it. And it's just like, why God, what are you doing? And, and what you need to know is God is not the author of that evil. I want to be clear on that. He's not the author of that evil. But what he does, even in allowing that evil, is he takes it and then he uses it in a supernatural way to ultimately bring about his perfect plan and will and to glorify him. You guys, I mean, what you see in Revelation 9 is we see God turning evil on itself. That's what he does. He says, okay, unleash. And that evil is turned on itself, okay? What they do, only he allows and grace limits what they can do. And so we see God using evil to judge evil. And in so doing, he is the one who will be glorified through it. And you guys, what he does in your life, I don't care what someone's done, said, thought about you. You cling to him. You keep him on the throne. He is at work. He hasn't abandoned you. Don't lose faith in him. He's on the throne. He is sovereign. And he can take and turn anything that was used against you for evil, and he can turn it for good. <laughs> 